In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Let us pray. Hail, O Lady, Holy Queen, Mother, Holy Mother of God. You are the Virgin May Church, and the one chosen by the Most Holy Father in Heaven, whom he consecrated with his Most Beloved Son, and with the Holy Spirit the Paraclete, in whom there was and is all fullness of grace and every good. Hail his palace, hail his tabernacle, hail his robe, hail his servant, hail his mother, and hail all you holy virtues, through which through the grace and light of the Holy Spirit are poured into the hearts of the faithful, so that from their faithless state you may make them faithful to God. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. That's a prayer to the Blessed Mother, which I dare say, without being offensive or anything, most of you have never heard before. Would I be right? And that beautiful prayer was written by St. Francis of Assisi. You know, have any of you seen the film Brother, Son, Sister Moon? Well, that's good. Sorry, Father. It's, it's the single worst movie ever made regarding the life of St. Francis of Assisi. <laughs> you didn't think I was going to go there, did you? But yes, it is. Someone who's been a Franciscan for 27 years, and I went to Rome specifically to learn uh, the Franciscan writings and Franciscan spirituality, I can say that that is the single worst film ever made on the life of Francis. It makes Francis out, I think I mentioned this the other day, maybe last night, as some sort of medieval hippie, you know, who was in tune with nature of some sort and, you know, sort of almost worshipped nature. The exact opposite of who Francis was. He's a man of God, a beautiful, a Catholic man, truly Catholic man, and uh, who loved the priesthood, loved the church, loved the sacraments, and especially loved the Blessed Mother. And um, people often ask me, Father, why did you become a conventional Franciscan friar? There are various branches of the Franciscans. Well, firstly, because my home parish was run and founded by the conventional Franciscan friars in a beautiful town called Warrawong, in a beautiful city called Wollongong in New South Wales, Australia. I bet you those are two names you've never heard of before either. So, um, and the second reason is because the conventional Franciscans for the last 800 years have always had a great love and devotion to the Mother of God. I'll talk about this later on when I speak about the Immaculate Conception, but it's thanks to us conventional Franciscans that we have the dogma today of the Immaculate Conception. And again, I'll speak about that a little bit later. When I speak about the Blessed Mother, I have a starting point which is rather unusual. And I'll give a little anecdote as, as to this as well. I, I've been to the Holy Land twice, thankfully, and ho I'm, hopefully some of you have been there. It's a singular experience being in the Holy Land. It really is. And um, both times I went with a parish pilgrimage group. And the first time I went, we had a lovely pilgrimage, and at the end of it, you know, we're having a sort of like go-away dinner, etc. And the people are standing around, are sitting around me. One lady asked me, Father, what was your favourite place? And not to say anything nasty or anything, but another lady, of course, didn't even let me answer. And she quickly butted in and said, oh, Father's favourite place was Bethlehem. I said, look, just, oh, okay, well, thank you very much for answering for me. <laughs> so then I counted. I said, well, why do you think Bethlehem? She said, well, because, you know, St. Francis and, you know, the, the baby Jesus and Gretcho and the nativity scene. Oh, by the way, that's the other thing. You know, I said yesterday about everything that the Franciscans have given to the church, the stations of the cross, the Angelus, and the nativity scene as well at Christmas. Yeah, St. Francis, 1223, Christmas Eve, the very first person to say, you know what, we should actually commemorate Christmas by putting a little Christmas scene together. You know, the baby Jesus, Mary and Joseph, no one had thought about it for 1,223 years, except St. Francis. So that's another thing that we gave to the church. Anyway, uh, she said, oh, Bethlehem, because, you know, that's where, um, you know, St. Francis, the Christmas. I said, well, yeah, that's very nice, but that actually wasn't my favourite place. Then another lady, sorry to the ladies, but it's always the ladies, another lady then, she said, I know what your favourite place was. And I said, where? She said, when we're up at Calvary, because you go up the stairs to Calvary, and we have... There's Calvary there, where the cross of Jesus Christ was, and that's looked after, ministered by the Greek Orthodox. But right next to it, literally from the altar to here, is the side altar where Mary stood at the foot of the cross. And that's, of course, ministered by the Latin Catholics. 
And she said, when we said Mass there at the foot of the cross at Our Lady's, uh, the Sorrowful Mother's Chapel, I said, well, actually, yes, you're right. I said, well, how, how did you know? She said, that was the only place in the last 10 days that you got emotional. I said, wow. Because as I said the other day, you know, being an Italian boy, I get emotional at the drop of a pin. It's quite easy. But I was very emotional there. Because for me, the starting point of any discussion, of any devotion, of any theology or spirituality when it comes to the mother of God starts, not ends, but begins with Mary at the foot of the cross. Let's listen to the words of St. John, chapter 19, verses 25 to 27. Standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary of Magdala. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple there whom he loved, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his home. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Before I go on to anything else about the Blessed Mother, let's start right here. Because this is actually where it all begins. You think, no, Father, it begins at the Annunciation. Don't worry, I know, I know my Bible, I know my stories, I know, I know what happened. But no, it begins here. Because something powerful is happening here. St. John, in writing this Gospel, is standing there at the foot of the cross. He captures the moment brilliantly, if I may say so, on his behalf. Because he begins with the words, standing at the foot of the cross. He uses that verb intentionally. Think about it. This is a Jewish mother, and that's not being uh, sort of, you know, uh, sort of, uh, you know uh, discriminatory in any way, but she's a Jewish mother who has just seen her son arrested, tortured, scourged at the pillar, carrying his cross up that hill, falling three times, crowned with thorns, nailed to the cross, and dying and bleeding to death. And yet St. John says, standing at the foot of the cross, she should be fainting at the foot of the cross. She should be weeping and mourning and screaming at the top of her lungs at the foot of the cross. She should be doing the traditional Jewish mourning of ripping and tearing her hair and taking her veil off, which is what they did at the foot of the cross. None of that. It's Mary. Standing at the foot of the cross. She shows us right at that moment Firstly, she is a woman of faith because it takes great faith to be able to stand there and see your son and stand at his foot, collecting the drops of blood as they come down his leg and his feet. Great courage. Courage because she's standing there in front of the Roman soldiers and the Sanhedrin who are, of course, with great glee, we finally got rid of him, the troublemaker, and the centurions who are quite happy with their handiwork as well. Gee, we've done a fine job with this one. But she's not scared. Standing at the foot of the cross, a woman of courage, a woman of faith, a woman of hope, because she knows there's something greater to come. She, exp she expresses and communicates all those great virtues in that one single act, standing at the foot of the cross. That's where we start with Mary. Not at the Annunciation. We'll get to, we'll get to that, don't you worry. But at the cross, standing at the foot of the cross. Then St. John tells us of one of the seven last words that Jesus speaks at the cross. Remember, the seven last words are just exactly seven words. They're the seven last expressions of Jesus. Yeah, we, we, we understand that. 
One of those expressions are, behold your son, behold your mother. Again, picture it. Jesus is hanging from the cross. He's actually about to die. He has no air left in his lungs. Yet he expends what little energy, what little bit of oxygen he has in those lungs to speak these words. Does he need to speak these words? Of course John's going to look after her. Peter, James, and the rest of them, they're all going to look after her. That's what Jesus is talking about. He gives her to John as a mother and John to her as a son. Now, just before I go into that part, I'll go rewind a little bit. And we speak about this regarding one of the dogmas of the Blessed Mother is her perpetual virginity. There are four dogmas of Mary that we believe in the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. Four. A dogma is a doctrine that must be held by every Catholic. For example, the dogma of the Trinity, the dogma of the two natures of Jesus, the dogma of the Eucharist, the dogma of the sacraments. They are dogmas. They are truths given to us from the apostles that are held by every Catholic. Regarding Mary, there are four. She is the mother of God, Theotokos, dogma of the church. She is perpetually virgin, dogma of the church. She is the Immaculate Conception, dogma of the church, and she was assumed body and soul into heaven, dogma of the church. They are the four dogmas. Regarding perpetual virginity, I'll do that now. So I'll break up my talk a little bit. If Mary had children, this is nonsense. It's absolute nonsense what Jesus is saying here from the cross. It's true that oftentimes in Scripture, what does it say? Mary and the brothers and sisters of Jesus, doesn't it? Yeah. Judaism is a matrilinear religion. Now, that's a fancy word for you, isn't it? You do, when you woke up this morning, you thought, oh, I'm going to learn a new word today, matrilinear. There we go. It means it comes from the line of the mother. The mother is the be-all and end-all in Judaism. Yeah? I mean, we see that sort of in Hollywood, in sitcoms and things like that, but actually there's a truism to it. It's matrilinear. The Gospel writers would never have written Mary and the brothers and sisters of Jesus. That would have been of the most disrespect to Mary. They would have written, Mary and her sons and daughters came to see Jesus, etc., etc. I don't know about you, but in the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we never read that because it didn't happen. Perpetual virginity, before, during, and after the birth of Jesus, by the miracle of God. So fast forward again to this moment. Woman, behold your son, and you, blessed disciple John, behold your mother. What is Jesus doing here? He is commending. Better than that, he is gifting, gifting, a true gift of all the disciples, past, present, and future, to be sons and daughters of Mary, and Mary to be their mother. Now, why do I start here, not the Annunciation? Because think about it now. This is the completion of the Annunciation. At the Annunciation, the angel of the Lord declared unto Mary, etc., so as we read, to pray in the angels. The Archangel Gabriel comes to Mary. Hail, full of grace. Full of grace. She's the Immaculate Conception. You are called to be the mother of the Son of God. But how can this be? Etc., etc. Let it be done unto me according to thy word. The great fiat, the yes of Mary. Fiat miki secundum verbum tum. Let it be done unto me according to your word. She says yes to God, to be the mother of the incarnate word, the mother of the second person of the blessed trinity, the mother of the logos, the word of God. <coughs> Fast forward those 33 years, 
It's a second annunciation. A second annunciation. Jesus says, behold your son. She goes from being the mother of Jesus to being the mother of every disciple, every Christian, everyone who calls himself a son and daughter of God. And she says yes again. John doesn't have to write, and Mary said, let it be done unto me according to your word, Jesus. No. John writes, and from that moment, he took her into his home. That was the yes. It's the great arc of Mary's life and ministry and vocation. She too has a vocation. She's the mother of Jesus to now being the mother of every disciple. And that's why she is standing at the foot of the cross. She's standing there for us, for all of us. What a beautiful scene. Jesus, from his dying breath, gives Mary to every Christian as a gift. Now I pose this rhetorical question. Who are we to reject that gift? Who is any Christian who believes in the Word of God, the divine inspiration of the Word of God, to reject that gift of Mary as our mother? She's not called our mother just for any pious reason. She's not called our mother because it's tradition or because it's cute and nice and lovely to have a mother in heaven. She's our mother because Jesus, from his dying breath from the cross, is still thinking about us because he loves us so much, he does not want to leave us orphaned. She was my mother, she is now your mother. And it makes perfect sense. In the whole theology of the church, it makes perfect sense. If the church is the body of Christ, and Mary is the mother of Christ, she is ipso facto the mother of the church, the mother of every Christian, past, present, and future. That is the starting point always when discussing the Blessed Mother. There, standing at the foot of the cross. As you can see, I cannot under, at, at any time overestimate, of course, the importance of this moment. Thank you, St. John, for being there at the foot of the cross. Because St. John doesn't run away. What did I say yesterday about the difference between an apostle and a disciple? I'm sure you all remember, don't you, yeah? Disciple is the follower, yeah? I like to say, and I, I don't think it's heresy, so don't report me, Father Portelli, please. I don't think it's heresy. But at the night of Holy Thursday, the 11... Well, by this stage, of course, Judas has gone. The, the ten who, of course, distanced themselves and desert Jesus lost their status just for a little time of being called a disciple because rather than following, they abandoned. A disciple cannot abandon. For that little bit of time between Holy Thursday night, Good Friday morning, and in the appearances of Jesus, they stop being disciples, except John. John is special. John, as Father will know, of course, is the only disciple we celebrate with white gold vestments. Why? Because all the other disciples gave their life for God. They're all martyred. They're all celebrated in the red vestments of the martyrs, but not John. Why? Because from that moment, he took her into his home. It's not like he was scared. He didn't run away from wanting to be martyred. He had a different responsibility. But even better still, he didn't have to be martyred because he had the courage to stand at the foot of the cross. He said to himself, hang on, this is not right. Where did you guys all go? Peter, hang on, what's going on here? Mary's going to be on her own. She can't be there on her own. I'll go with her. And he did. And thank God he did, because he could give us this beautiful moment, this most intimate moment from the cross. Behold your mother. Imagine his heart exploding at that moment. 
with great love. And that's, of course, where Mary is. There's another aspect about this that I'll just go into before going into the other aspects of the Blessed Mother. And that, of course, is then at the resurrection, which I've just mentioned. Where in the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John does it mention that Jesus appeared to his mother after the resurrection? Does it? It doesn't, does it? So he appears to Mary Magdalene at the tomb, to Peter and John. He goes to the upper room, peace be with you. Nowhere does Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John say, oh, and he appeared to his mother. Well, again, they didn't have to. Because when you think about it, the sacred heart of Jesus, and here we are in the parish of the sacred heart of Jesus, but the sacred heart of Jesus and the immaculate heart of Mary were so intimately united that the moment of his resurrection, she knew. Of course she knew. When he was suffering, as the great saints, the fathers of the church remind us, she was suffering. She's our lady of sorrows. When she's seen dying on the cross, she is suffering with him because her immaculate heart for that moment becomes the sorrowful heart of Mary. But at the resurrection, her heart, her immaculate heart, would have exploded with the same light that exploded in that tomb of the resurrection because they're, they're united perfectly. She didn't have to be told. She would have been there making her cup of tea and would have gone, oh, yeah, he, he's risen. Okay, all is good now. I can go and drink in my cup of tea. She knew. She just knew. That's a beautiful part of our faith, that beautiful intimate relationship between mother and son, that beautiful relationship that he wants to give her to us. So when we speak about Mary and devotion to Mary, we don't have to worry about explaining anything to people who don't want to hear about Mary and devotion to Mary. And by the way, I'm not having a go at other Protestant groups or anything. I'm talking about Catholics themselves. We all know Catholics who have very little time for the Blessed Mother. And that's sad. Because again, the Second Vatican Council did not diminish in any way at all love and devotion and the role of the Blessed Mother in the history of salvation. In fact, Pope Paul VI made sure about that in the beautiful Vatican II document, Lumen Gentium, which is the dogmatic constitution of the church, which is a whole chapter on the Blessed Virgin Mary. Let's never forget that. But who is Mary? Of course, we know her as a young Jewish girl whose parents were Joachim and Anne. We know the Blessed Mother through the beautiful accounts of sacred scripture particularly St. Luke's Gospel and St. John's Gospel. St. Matthew's too, but St. Matthew likes to sort of focus firstly on Joseph. No problem with that. We all love Joseph. So St. Luke's Gospel. We read about all the beautiful events leading up to the birth of Jesus and then after the birth of Jesus, our loving Saviour as well. But from the tradition of the Gospels, we then have the tradition of the Church, Remember, the one holy Catholic and apostolic church is founded upon two very important pillars, sacred scripture and tradition. And there's nothing wrong in saying that because it's actually from tradition that we got the Bible in the first place. That's not heresy. The Bible wasn't magically given to us. It was written by the early fathers of the church and codified by the early councils of the church. So it's actually tradition that gave us the Bible in the first place which is why they are the two pillars on which the church rests. And through the tradition of the church, as I said, we have those four very important dogmas of the Blessed Mother. And it's good for us to be reminded about what they mean for us today. First is the dogma of Mary, the mother of God. This was a real tricky one. The great heresies, the great schism in the church at the time, a great separation, a split in the church when it came to calling Mary the mother of God. Councils had to be called, the Council of Ephesus as well had to be called to codify and to give us this teaching. Why? Well, when you think about it, it's rather problematic. God is God. God who, as St. Francis says, not even the heavens can contain. God who's got no beginning 
who's got no end, God who is God. How can God have a mother? It's impossible when you hear about it. But of course, like all dogmas, all doctrines, it comes down to the person of Jesus, doesn't it? We say that Jesus, of course, has two natures. He has his divine nature and his human nature. And they come together perfectly in the person of Jesus. One does not deny the other. So basically what people were saying is, no, Mary was just simply the mother of the human Jesus. Well, that's a heresy. Because then you're separating the human nature from the divine nature. You cannot do that with Christ. Not at all. If Mary is his mother, she's the mother of the whole Christ, both his human nature and his divine nature. And she is the mother of the whole Christ, and therefore the mother of the second person of the Blessed Trinity. She's daughter of the Father, mother of the Son, and spouse of the Holy Spirit. She fits in perfectly with the Blessed Trinity. She's not part of the Blessed Trinity, no. We believe in one God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, but she's perfectly formed into that Trinity. Daughter of the Father, Mother of the Son, Spouse of the Holy Spirit. So to be called the Mother of God fits perfectly in who Christ is, the Theotokos, beautiful Greek word which means the God-carrier, the God-bearer. That's exactly who she was. We celebrate that beautiful feast day on the 1st of January. How appropriate. On the octave day of Christmas. To complete that beautiful octave, those eight days of Christmas. To show us her role in all of this. Mother of God. Dogma of the Blessed Virgin Mary. And rightly so. Then we have the dogma of her perpetual virginity. Again, a difficult one to understand. People have argued over this. They still argue over this today. But it's a dogma of the church. The dogma of the church states that before, during and after the birth of Christ, Mary retained her virginity, which is why we still call her the Blessed Virgin Mary. She gave birth to no other children, as I just mentioned a moment ago. Judaism is matrilinear. It would have been greatest disrespect for the gospel writers not to mention her children. He was the only begotten. Only. And that's part of her greatness as well. And the beauty of that beautiful marriage between Joseph and Mary. And it's not rude or heretical to say so, but Joseph was truly a righteous man as St. Matthew calls him, truly righteous, to look after the Blessed Mother and the baby Jesus. Joseph has a role in the church, and St. John the 23rd gave him a very important role in the church, and St. John Paul II continued that great tradition, but making sure we understood that he is the guardian of the Redeemer and patron of the universal church. So when things are going wrong in the church, as we always like to think they are, do we turn to Joseph? Well, the answer should be yes, we need to. We need to pray to St. Joseph every single day for the Holy Father, for the Cardinal and for the bishops, priests as well, the leadership of the church, that they look to Joseph, the righteous man, who did everything in silence. There's not one single word of Joseph noted in the Gospels. You go to Matthew's Gospel, nothing. He says not a word. In silence, he does everything. Boy, I pray every day for more silence, I'm telling you now. I, I, I'll be honest, I know this is being recorded and, and there's nothing wrong in saying so. I love the Holy Father, but sometimes less is more. And there's nothing wrong in saying that. Sometimes we can say too many words. And we are in a world, in a society, saturated by words. We need silence. And Joseph teaches us silence. 
There's nothing wrong in saying that. Silence in our churches, silence during mass, and silence in everything as well. Because it's through silence that we hear God speaking to us, just as Joseph and Mary did. The third dogma is the Immaculate Conception, given to us in 1854, I think, or 1858. I always get those dates confused. I don't even have it written down. It's not important. It is important, but I don't have it written down. But of course, that great dogma that, um, again, problematic. What does the dogma of the Immaculate Conception teach us? That as a singular grace, Mary was conceived without the stain of original sin. Again, even in 2022, so many Catholics think that the Immaculate Conception has everything to do with the birth of Jesus. No. There is no Immaculate Conception there. He is, he is the most godly, divine conception. There's, you can't get more immaculate than that. No. The Immaculate Conception has to do with Mary in the womb of her mother. And again, very contentious throughout the ages. Even St. Thomas Aquinas, the greatest thinker in the church, could not reconcile the dogma of the Immaculate Conception. Now, I have to say, under my breath, neither could St. Bonaventure the Franciscan, but we won't go there. However, from the writings of St. Francis of Assisi, St. Anthony of Padua, a great Franciscan, only in the, in the early 1300s, so this is only, um, you know, 100 years after Thomas Aquinas, his name was John Duns Scotus, blessed John Duns Scotus, a great Franciscan mind. He came up with a great teaching, which was then used throughout the next few hundred years to give us the dogma of the Immaculate Conception. Because what's the biggest problem with the dogma of the Immaculate Conception? I'll tell you. When Jesus Christ, a loving Savior, suffered, died on the cross, and rose on the, th on the third day, he redeemed us from our sins. That's not salvation, it's redemption. It's what we call the universal redemption. St. Paul reminds us, he redeemed all creation, all creation from the stain of original sin. He redeemed all creation. But if he redeemed all creation, that includes the Blessed Mother, because she's part of all creation. And so therefore she needed redeeming, she needed redemption, which means that she had original sin. So Thomas Aquinas and all the other great saints are like, no, she couldn't have been the Immaculate Conception, because therefore the universal redemption of Jesus is imperfect, because it means he redeemed all creation, billions and billions of people in all of the universe, minus one person. It doesn't make sense. But John Duns Scotus reminded us something very important. He said three simple Latin words, which I can't remember now. <laughs> he said, decuit, potuit, ergo, fetch it. It was fitting for God to do so. He could do so. Therefore, he did it. It's really a 21st century kind of mentality when you think about it. How did John Scotus explain this? He said, why are we putting God in the box of time? God doesn't belong to time. We belong to time. God created time. He's not constrained by day, month, and year, hour, minute, second. No, he's God. Jesus did redeem his mother, but not at the moment in time of the passion, death, and resurrection, but before that, at her conception, she was redeemed in lieu of that moment, because in God's plan, everything is outside of time. You think to yourself, hang on, that's a little bit too easy, but it's not. It's theologically correct. God chooses what he wills with his time and how it's done. Potuit, decuit, it was fitting for him to do so because he wanted a perfect vessel for his son. Potuit, he could do so because, sorry, he's God. Ergo fetch it, and therefore he did it. She was 
conceived without the stain of original sin, to be the perfect vessel, the most clean vessel for the Word of God to come down from heaven into the womb of a woman. And that is the only reason. So in a sense, thank God she said yes at the Annunciation. (laughs) Because otherwise, God would be up there going, oh, come on in, you're kidding me. After all that, you have to have a little bit of sense of humour here. But it's true, though, when you think about it. And I'm going to go to another thing there. I said, oh, thank God she said yes. I know what most Catholics think. Oh, well, of course she said yes. She's the Blessed Mother. But she was going to say no. Was Mary the only immaculate conception? I should do a roll call here, a, a, a survey. What do we think, yes or no? Hands up for yes. Was she the only immaculate conception? Oh, we have a few brave souls. Who thinks no? Going on. Oh, good one. All right, there we go. No, she wasn't. You think, Father, that's heretical. We're forgetting Adam and Eve. Ouch! Excuse, they committed the original sin. They were conceived before original sin. They were conceived perfectly. And this is important to note from the church fathers. Because when we think that, of course, Mary would say yes, because she's the Immaculate Conception, she said yes because she was listening to the Archangel Gabriel and realized, of course, the greatness of this moment. And her yes is the perfect yes. Our our choices, my dear people, are always tainted because we have the stain of original sin. We're, We're washed away from original sin in our baptism, and then there's concupiscence, that wanting to do against what God wants us to do. And so when we say yes or no, it's never a perfect yes and never a perfect no. It cannot be, because we're not perfect. That's why Jesus said in today's Gospel, be perfect, because we're not. Mary has perfect free will. So if she said yes, if she said she did say yes, I beg your pardon, when she said yes, it was the single most perfect yes that we will ever have in human history. There'll never be another yes like Mary's yes. Never, ever, ever. Because never will we have someone with perfect free will. Rewind, Adam and Eve had perfect free will. So when they said no to God, that was the most perfect no in all of human history. When we celebrate lex orandi, lex credendi, as I mentioned on the weekend masses, when we celebrate these things, we celebrate them for this reason. It's why we have the reading of Genesis at the Feast of the Immaculate Conception. Because their perfect no is outdone by her, mother, by her perfect yes. She unties the knot of the no of Adam and Eve. And that's why she's the Immaculate Conception. So she, that God gave her the ability to have perfect free will. Because he was disappointed a little bit with Adam and Eve. He wasn't going to be disappointed with this one. She's my mother. I'm not going to be disappointed with her. Her perfect yes outdid the perfect no. And that's the most important reason for her being the Immaculate Conception. The Immaculate Conception, not just a beautiful title in the litany, beautiful name that we give the mother, what she said to St. Bernadette in Bernadette's dialect, I am the Immaculate Conception. She's the Mac Conception because God willed her, conceived her to be such, to outdo what had been done at the time of the Garden of Eden and the original sin. Then we come to the next dogma, the assumption of Mary, body and soul, into heaven. Now, as a Franciscan, you would think, again, just like that lady at the, at the Holy Land, you know, Or you think, oh, well, Father's favorite place of Bethlehem, but no, it wasn't. You'd think, because the Franciscans had everything to do with calling and uh, with formulating uh, the theology and the teaching of the Immaculate Conception, that that would be my favorite dogma. 
Well, actually, it's the assumption. And for one simple reason, I was born on the feast day of the assumption of the Blessed Mother, <laughs> the 15th of August. So I was born on her feast day. I mean, what better sign was that? Everyone who says to me, of course you're a priest, of course you're a Franciscan. I was born on her feast. There's a great solemnity of the assumption of Mary, the fourth dogma. And it is a beautiful dogma. Because I kind of see it this way. It's the mirror to the Immaculate Conception. I always like to look at these things in mirrors, just like the Annunciation and Mary at the foot of the cross kind of mirror each other. Well, I like to think the Immaculate Conception and the Assumption kind of mirror each other. Because the Immaculate Conception shows us who we were meant to have been. If it wasn't for Adam and Eve and no original sin, we would have all have been Immaculate Conception. Yeah? It's the state of original sin that stops us from that. So the Immaculate Conception of the Blessed Virgin Mary reminds us of who we were meant to have been. The Assumption, which is kind of why it's my favourite dogma, reminds us of where we are going. So it's a great dogma of hope. Immaculate Conception is a great dogma of hope as well, but hope for us. Because what do we teach in the dogma of the Immaculate Conception? That at the moment, at the end of her life, Remember, it doesn't say at her death. Now, this is another contentious issue because there's schools of thought that say, well, Mary actually didn't die. At, at the end of her life, she was simply assumed body and soul into heaven. Other schools of teaching throughout the last 2,000 years say, no, of course she died. If her son died, she died as well. The dogma simply states, at the end of her earthly life, she was assumed body and soul into heaven. And what's the difference between that and us? Well, there's a big difference because I'm sure many of us have been to a funeral. We're not assumed body and soul into heaven. Our soul goes where God wills it to go, and we'll hear about that tomorrow with the four last things. But we know that our body goes to earth. Was that God's plan for us? No. When God created me, Friar Benedict Maria La Volpe, conventional Franciscan, he created me body, soul, mind, and heart. They are the four parts of the human person. That's the Christian theology and philosophy. Okay? When our loving Savior Jesus Christ says, Love the Lord your God with all your soul, with all your heart, what does he say? With all your soul, heart, mind, and strength. Strength is the body, the four parts of the human person. That's why Jesus uses those terms, the loving Savior. Where was I going with this? I've lost my train of thought. Um, assumed. Yes, that's right. Assumption, that's very important. Um, we, we are not assumed, but she was. Her body could not decay because there's no original sin. Another reason that those two go hand in hand. But God didn't design us, didn't create us, to be separate, to have our body, soul, mind, and heart separated at the moment of death. That was not in his divine plan. It's the original sin that changed all of that. That's why we say in the Creed on Sundays, he will come again in his glory to judge the living and the dead. The great final judgment, the body, soul, heart, and mind will come back together in our glorified existence. We are called to be in our bodily state. That's why our bodies are important. They are, that's why we call them the temple of the Holy Spirit. That's why we're called to look after our bodies and not discard them because our bodies will come back. The assumption of Mary, body and soul into heaven is a sign to us of what we're all called to be. We will also be one day outside of this great time, body and soul in heaven. And so that's a very important teaching for us because it gives us that, that sort of that, that inspiration to look after body, mind, soul, and heart, the four parts of the human person. One is not less important or one is not more important than the other. People without faith, unfortunately, don't look after the soul 
They, they say, yeah, body's important, mind and spirit. It's a catchphrase that's missing the soul. And it's a soul that's made in the image and likeness of God. It's, it's kind of important. So when we think about the great uh, dogma of the Assumption of Mary, it actually has as much to do with her as it does with each and every one of us. It's kind of like it's our dogma as well. We look to the Assumption and say, wow, that's going to be me one day. But if I want it to be me one day, I better start doing something about it. Looking after body, looking after soul, looking after mind, and looking after heart. These things are very, very important because they are who we are, my identity. So Mary's assumption, body and soul to heaven, shows us, of course, the importance of who we are, but also where she is now. She reigns as queen of heaven and earth because she's actually in heaven, body and soul, with her son. There are beautiful paintings, but we have the most beautiful mosaic at Marytown, where I am. Marytown, where I am, is a very beautiful chapel built in the early 1930s. And um, around the top of the walls are mosaics that picture the episodes in the life of the Blessed Mother, from her own presentation in the temple, all the way marriage of Joseph and Mary, all the way through. And the very last one is Jesus embracing Mary at her assumption. I mean, it's just so beautiful. Mother and son reunited as it should be. And what is she doing there? She's interceding for us. From the foot of the cross, that's the role she was given. So many Catholics, let alone other Christians, but so many Catholics forget of the intercessory role of the Blessed Virgin Mary and indeed of the communion of saints. Now, even though the saints are not body and soul in heaven, but they are in heaven. That's why they're called saints. They're not saints because we canonize them. They're saints because they're in heaven and therefore we have canonized them. But they're interceding for us, speaking on behalf of us. I know what people are thinking at times, but no, we just, Jesus is the one mediator. Of course he's the one mediator. But even he wants to listen to the opinions of his mother and, of course, of the saints as well. They're just simply working for us, helping us, speaking on our behalf. Isn't it great to have a friend in heaven? Why would we say no to that? I mean, I need all the friends I can have in heaven, that's for sure. I'm not going to start rejecting them now. The Blessed Mother is there at Jesus' side. And we all know that a mother's heart, there's nothing like a mother's heart, nothing. A child can do so many bad things and a mother always forgives, always. It's an incredible aspect of the maternal heart. I'm amazed at the strength of the heart of a mother. Absolutely amazed. When my father went to God, my mother, simple Italian housewife, wow. She showed strength unimaginable to me. Even to this day, 14 years later, she's 81 and she's a tough cookie, I tell you what, you don't mess with her. I, I certainly don't, that's for sure. <laughs> but a maternal heart is a maternal heart. And that's just our own mums. Think about her. A maternal heart that is perfect. A maternal heart that is immaculate. A maternal heart that is sorrowful. You want her on your side. The great St. Maximilian Kolbe, I wish I could have just one evening to speak about him, said to us very beautifully in one of his writings, and I'll finish with this. Never be afraid of loving the Blessed Mother too much because you can never love her more than her own son did. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Amen.